2 Corinthians chapter 12 I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, fourteen years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast except of my weakness. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I have been a fool. You forced me to it. For I ought to have been commended by you. For I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. For in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong. Here for the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? But granting that I myself did not burden you, I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit. Did I take advantage of you? through any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not act in the same spirit? Did we not take the same steps? Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? In the sight of God, we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may not find you as I wish, and that you may not find me as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder, and I may have to mourn. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. This is God's Word, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in the English Standard Version, the ESV. Well, we're coming now to a crescendo within the book of 2 Corinthians. Paul is very passionate. He's very much focused on Christ his glory, his strength, his grace, his gospel, his people. He is, he's now telling them, he says, I must go on boasting. And he kind of shifts in a little different way. See, in chapter 11, he's doing all this foolish boasting about credentials and things like that. Now he says, I'm going to talk to you about visions and revelations of the Lord. But then he takes a little shift and he sort of backs off a little bit. And he starts sort of talking about himself in the third person. 
I know a man. Now, this is very evidently the Apostle Paul himself, who probably at the time when he was stoned and left for dead, was caught up into heaven. The third heaven, it says. There's, that's a, a biblical way of talking about well, the place that we refer to as heaven. So he's caught up in the third heaven. Like I said, most probably when he was stoned and left for dead on his first missionary journey. He says it was 14 years ago. We know he's talking about himself, even though he says, I know a man. And he says, you know, on behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast. We know it's him because in verse 7, he says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. So we know he is talking about himself, but he, he distances himself because he doesn't really want this experience to be caught up in the foolish boasting that he's been engaged in in chapter 11. He, he, he kind of takes a step back and he says, Look, this is what happened. And he, he says twice, I don't know whether it was in the body or out of the body. Notice Paul didn't write a best-selling book telling all about his experiences. What he says about his experiences of being caught up in the heaven is very clear and it should be very sobering because what he says is that, verse 4, he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. 2 Corinthians 12, 4 should be the verse that cancels any Christian publisher from publishing a book telling about someone's visit to heaven, whether that's 90 minutes in heaven or the boy who died and went to heaven or whatever it is. 2 Corinthians 12, 4 tells us on the authority of God's word that anyone who actually has been to heaven and has come back cannot tell about what they have seen because these are things which man may not utter. So that's my, that's my little speech on that topic. It's a good way to make a lot of money, unfortunately, in the evangelical Christian world. But let's get to the thorn in the flesh. So to keep him from becoming conceited, because he had been to heaven and had come back, he had seen the glories of Christ in heaven revealed. So to keep him from becoming conceited, God then sends him a thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what this is, except that he describes it as a messenger of Satan to harass me and to keep me from becoming conceited. We don't know if he was coming under particular demonic attack, doubts, temptation, we don't know. It's speculation. He doesn't tell us. And so because he doesn't tell us, we don't need to speculate. We just know that it was terrible. I mean, you don't describe something as a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me if it's something that's mild or easy, especially the fact that he pleaded with the Lord three times that this should leave him and that God said no. God said no. If you've ever prayed something to God earnestly, and sincerely and had God say no to you, let these two examples from the Bible stand out in your mind. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, God said no. God answered no to his own son when his son said, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, because it wasn't possible. And Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then God told the Apostle Paul, who wrote half the books of the New Testament, most successful missionary in the history of the church, and God told the Apostle Paul no three times. So if God ever answers your prayer no, don't think it's because he's mad at you, or he doesn't like you, or he doesn't want what's good for you. This thorn in the flesh was good for Paul because it showed him his weakness and it caused him to depend ever more on the power of Christ and not on his own strength. He could very easily have relied on his own strength. We can all, all too easily rely on our own strength. But God sends us weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. We read those in verse 10. So that when we are weak, when we are weak, we depend upon Christ, and in Christ we are strong. 
And then the second half of chapter 12, we're not going to spend a long time on this, but basically he's saying to them, I'm going to come to you a third time. I'm planning on making a third visit to you, and I don't want it to be a difficult visit. I've done everything that a true apostle would do among you, signs and wonders, mighty works. I've given you the word of God free of charge. I've ministered among you with integrity, and yet there are still some among you who are unrepentant, and they need to repent before I come. Our response to the gospel coming to us needs to be a, a response of repentance. Whatever impurity there is in our lives, God is serious when he calls us to repent. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, which is perfect, complete, sufficient, and wonderful. We thank you for weaknesses. We thank you for times when we don't get our way, when our prayers are not answered the way we would want them to be answered. Those times are painful for us, Lord, but we thank you for them because you are at work to show us your strength in our weakness. So help us to be content with weakness. And Father, give us the grace to repent of those things in our lives that are impure, selfish, unpleasing to you. Give us the grace to repent. We love you. We thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.